All right. So uh, yes, lumbar facet replacement revisit. Now keep in mind, um, uh, you know, we, we talk about FDA approved devices uh, most of the time in CME type activities. This is not an FDA approved device. Uh, that's part of the disclaimer right off. Um, this is just the initial data associated with the investigational device exemption study or the FDA IDE study for a device uh, put out by Premier Spine, a company out of Israel. I have no financial relationship with Premier Spine. And the reason that this is a revisitation is that this is not the first device to go through investigational device exemption within the United States. But as my passion is motion preservation and spine surgery, this is something that dovetails very well into this uh, conference. And I'm very grateful to the Seattle Science Foundation for allowing me to present today. So I wanted to start with a quick case study. This is a 57 year old gentleman who uh, presented to my office, mostly because he had heard about the investigational device exemption study we were conducting. And he had uh, really weakness in an L5 nerve root distribution and pain both in an L5 and an S1 nerve root distribution. And you can see on his x-rays that he has about four millimeters of translational motion some um, transitional anatomy in which you can argue that that uh, more caudal vertebral body at the spondylolisthesis is either a highly lumbarized S1 or a uh, uh, sacralized L5. Uh, I'm not sure that that matters nearly as much as the patient's symptoms do. And his MRI uh, revealed severe central stenosis, but very well localized symptoms kind of to this L5 slash S1 region, dependent on what you want to term this region based on his transitional anatomy. And so again, severe stenosis at this level. Um, there's all sorts of options. This is the type of case that we'd flash up at NAST and do a straw poll of the audience. And I think you'd have you know, a fairly even distribution between folks that would say, hey, that's a grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis. Maybe there's a role for decompression only. I think at this point, probably the majority of hands would uh, indicate that they'd do some type of fusion along with this because of the four millimeters of translational motion. And that could be done through an A-lift with indirect decompression or do it all posterior, posterior T-lift with direct decompression. Are there any other options? And uh, so at any rate, just to give a little bit of background, for some reason, we talk about the discs a lot. And you know, with our conference even today thus far, we've looked at cervical disc arthroplasty. There's a large role now, and, and we understand the data behind lumbar disc arthroplasty. But we spend much time looking, much less time looking at the facets themselves. And so the facets are a synovial joint, just like a knee joint, a hip joint, an ankle joint, et cetera. And as such, they're subject to arthritis and osteoarthritis. And of course, the facets play a critical role in our spines. And uh, you know, this role is, is somewhat overlooked and or maybe just addressed with fusion type surgery typically. Um, in general, if you look at surgical treatment of arthritis, we only have three options resection of that joint, which doesn't work well in the facets because the primary stabilizing role they play in the spine, arthroplasty, which we really haven't had anything available for us to do that with, versus fusion, which has been our workhorse in these cases. And so, uh, you know, the knee uh, is a hinge joint, the hip, a ball and socket joint, the spine motion segment is much more complex. So we have a disc that handles axial loading and shock absorption and is really a, a more fibrous type joint and then the facets that are true synovial joints but uh, they provide resistance to shear motion while otherwise allowing normal uh, rotation, lateral bending, et cetera, of the lumbar spinal elements. And so if we look at pure weight bearing, about 70% of our weight bearing goes through the disc, and while 30% weight bearing may go through the facets, they really accommodate our normal motion. And of course, what happens as these discs degenerate over time is that we can lose disc space height versus we can have primary facet degeneration. And as the facets degenerate, whether it be because of increased loading, because of this decreased disc space height, or whether it be primary facet arthrosis, we can develop instability in the spine and lose that check rein to translational motion, which then can develop spondylolisthesis. The facet and the facet hypertrophy itself can contribute to spinal stenosis, as well as disc herniation and other elements that can cause the severe stenosis we see in our, uh, our, our test patient here. And so, um, we sort of understand the solutions that are available to us with spondylolisthesis, but again, I would argue that the jury is out in many cases as to whether we decompress only, decompress and fuse, and do we have other options. And so a study that was published on April 14, 2016 in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at laminectomy plus fusion versus laminectomy alone for lumbar spondylolisthesis. And the long and the short of it was that they showed some increased benefit with decompression and fusion, and this is represented in this chart. Um, that the patients that were treated with decompression only 
seemed to have more improvement in outcomes at two years of follow-up. Well, in the exact same New England Journal of Medicine, they presented this same, uh, a Scandinavian study that was uh, also prospectively done, looking at patients that were randomized into fusion surgery uh, with decompression versus decompression only. And of course, surprisingly, this study found that uh, there was no significant difference between these two patients and that decompression actually did slightly better and that there were potentially fewer side effects with it. And again, this same study was higher powered than the original study that I, I showed, but uh, here's kind of the same results in a more tabular format. And so then if we have this indecision and we're unable to decide what's our best approach, um, you know, it opens the door for trying to adopt a new way of sort of looking at these problems and seeing if there's a solution that might offer us a more agreed upon outcome associated with this particular problem and uh, enter then, you know, the idea of facet replacement. And this particular device, uh, again, is a device that's out of, a comp uh, out of uh, Israel originally, but has uh, been approved in Europe and has been placed in Europe and is currently undergoing an investigational device exemption, is a pedicle screw-based device that allows for axial rotation, lateral bending, extension, flexion, and constrained sagittal translation, which is essentially recreating the forces that the facets provide to a complex spinal unit while also allowing us to do a uh, very comprehensive decompression, which in most cases is what the patient needs. So at any rate, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the study design and hope that the slides catch up to us here. But the idea of this FDA IDE uh, trial is a non-inferiority study in which we're comparing single level transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion to single level facet replacement. And the qualifying population is patients that have stenosis uh, from L2 to L5 associated with a grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis. And the randomization happens prospectively. The patient is blinded preoperatively as to which treatment arm they've been selected for. And we're randomizing two to one into the facet replacement versus transferaminal lumbar inner body fusion population. I may have to exit the slideshow here. And we're following these patients for a total two years uh, afterwards, looking at the two-year outcome data and comparing it to uh, the PLIF data. Um, right now, the information that I have contained in the slideshow is our information, the outcomes uh, associated with the uh, facet replacement uh, portion of the study. And um, I may have to restart PowerPoint here. I apologize. Um, and we're... Yes. Would you like us to bring up your slides for you? If you have it, that would, yeah, uh, we'll bring it they up. were modified somewhat, but uh, go ahead and bring up the old ones and we can work okay. those. Give us yeah. just one second, please. Yep. And we'll Thank give you. you control once we do. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Dr. Kent, do you mind if I ask you a question real quick? Yeah, please do. Perfect timing. For, for the study where they, you're talking about, you know, kind of how they're designing this, is there uh, much taken into account for the patients that might have, you know, a, a tall disc versus a totally collapsed disc and, you know, where you're kind of thinking this is probably more discogenic pain versus facetogenic, or are you trying to kind of look at everyone and see if that comes out at the end? Yeah, so I think that's an excellent uh, question and, and no, not necessarily. Within our study criteria, we like people to have at least 50% of their disc space height left. And um, so that's one of the considerations, but it's a lesser consideration. Really, we're identifying a patient population that has instability in the spine and would benefit greatly primarily from a decompression. So again, what we're looking for is patients primarily with leg pain over back pain. And I think that's probably the best answer to the question is we're not here to treat back pain. We're here to treat the associated symptoms with stenosis, potential neurogenic claudication, and lumbar radiculopathy. So if they have a predominance of back pain, they're excluded from the study. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions at this time? Well, we're, uh, like I say, the, the last couple slides are just sort of our data that we have up to this point, and we'll be able to get to those relatively quickly, but now's a great time for questions if we have any other. Hey, let, me, uh, let me ask one, Roland. And I've, I've always kind of been confused by nomenclature. Yeah. What, what makes this facet replacement versus posterior dynamic stabilization like the, the denesis used to be or the... Um, there was a system from Synthes as well. W why is this more, the name, the nomenclature, just help me out with that. 
Right. Um, you know, in those cases, you know, dependent on the physician's approach to using Dynasys and other technologies, um, I guess it's a little bit the quality of the decompression. And Dynasys was you know, people used it very differently. I, I know of folks that would use Dynasys rods and try to affect the fusion, and they felt that using a dynamic stabilization device uh, gave them a better stress strain curve for fusion. I'm not sure that that makes sense to me from a, a basic sciences standpoint, but that was uh, part of the rationale behind that. Um, this device was designed from an engineering standpoint from the bottom up to be able to allow the normal motion of the uh, spinal segment. And so where the Dynasys rod really fails is its ability to allow for a lot of the side bending, um, the minimal translational motion, and then the lateral rotation that this device uh, was engineered from the ground up to allow. And you should have control, Dr. Kent. Excellent. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So again, I, I talked a little bit about the inclusion uh, criteria, especially uh, greater leg symptoms and back symptoms, and then the exclusion criteria are also uh, shown here in this slide. Boy. Um, I may, if I close this, I think I'll still have access to you guys. I apologize. I don't know if my screen is still sharing and you're able to, there we go. Can we see the slide presentation now? Yeah, and you have control to advance the slides. I'm trying. I might just have you go to the next slide for me. Yeah, just say next can. slide when you're ready. Yep, that'd be great. I apologize for the uh, issues here, but so our uh, demographics, uh, go ahead, next slide. Yeah. Uh, show a slight female pre preponderance over male with a mean age of about 63.1, uh, mean BMI of 30.1, so generally a, a slightly fitter population than probably what I see at a baseline. Next slide. And uh, so here we're demonstrating the ODI. So our preoperative ODI on average is around 57. And then at week six, uh, with uh, folks included in the study thus far, we've seen a drop down to 22.1 and having that uh, level up to about 11.5 at 12 months post-op. We can do the next slide. And seeing a similar trend with our VAS for both back and leg pain. And so this is interesting in my mind because I just barely mentioned to you that we wanted folks with greater leg pain than back pain. However, the amount of back pain in this population was still quite high. So even on average, the leg pain VAS higher than the back pain VAS. We see a very nice response to both back pain and leg pain in the treatment population. Next slide. And then uh, improvements in the ZCQ or Zurich Claudication Questionnaire. Um, we see functional improvement at uh, every time after surgery. Next slide. And so 153 patients are what, what that data is from thus far. This shows the improvement over one year's time in the ODI, the VAS back, the VAS leg, and the ZQL, both symptom severity and physical function. So uh, we see great on average improvement over these 153 patients. Next slide. And the uh, Reoperation rate, reintervention rate is uh, demarcated here. Nine total patients that return to surgery for these complications listed. And it also uh, demonstrates how long that was afterwards. Actually, go back one slide. I think the one that's sort of interesting to key in on a little bit is that uh, the, slide, the next slide that shows the complication. Yep, we see the screw loosening, and we only had one patient in which we saw screw loosening almost two years after the index procedure. And that's something that with your dynasis rods or with your facet replacement strategies in the past is something that we need to be aware of and you know, may even require more than two years follow-up to sort of elucidate over time. Next slide. And so uh, thus far in the randomized control trial, we've demonstrated uh, significant post-operative improvement uh, through one year with low reoperation rates that are similar to those reported in the literature for both PLIF and for posterior lumbar interbody fusion. And uh, thus far, facet arthroplasty seems to be a successful method or at least a, uh, anal analogous to TLIF in controlling uh, stenosis and spondylolisthesis in these patients. If we can go to the next slide, this is a return to our index uh, procedure. This particular patient was randomized to TOPS. And I think what's sort of interesting here is that the uh, patient still has sort of a fixed uh, grade one spondylolisthesis, but this patient had nearly complete resolution of both his back and leg pain and uh, was very grateful for the opportunity to be enrolled in the study. The next uh, 
flood. I think I believe that's the last one. So my conclusions are out that uh, it's a good solution for a grade one spondylolisthesis, perhaps another tool within the toolbox as to how we can treat these patients, maybe even more confusion at NAS next time we ask people to raise hands. But really the keys to success are obviously good patient selection, a wide decompression, including a complete facetectomy. Um, and uh, in January 2022 is when we'll release the comparison to the control group in this study and have a better idea how the prospective randomized groups did against each other. Any questions? I think we're good. Hey, thank you very much. Sorry about the, uh, the electronic glitch, but you did a good recovery. Yeah, no problem at all. And thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Uh, this is an exciting conference and I'm glad to be a part of it. Appreciate it. Thank you.